a temple in Tennessee? Mm -hmm. Really? Interesting. He said, not only is it potentially Egyptian, he says, look at the names. Because Jesus Christ, the great peacemaker, came to this continent. Now this is what is depicted of Jesus Christ. Now to you, you may not believe that, but these are some of the understandings that we have. Jews from Jerusalem came to this continent. This ain't of the devil. Mm. This is not of the devil. This is of the one true light of the world. So I wanted to know more. People from the Tower of Babel came to this continent. Was the Dene were very numerous. There was as many as maybe one and a half million of people that became Dene. The Book of Mormon is not divinely inspired. My question to you, have you ever read the Book of Mormon? Hey guys. Okay, so last week a video popped up and started playing. The video is called, Is the Book of Mormon Divinely Inspired? And it was a debate between Jacob Hansen from the YouTube channel Thoughtful Faith and Trent Horn from the Council of Trent. Now, I was not familiar with Trent Horn before this video, so I was curious and I watched the entire thing. This was the day that it came out and I had all of these thoughts. I remember as I would hear Trent Horn, who is a Catholic, make claims or point out things in which he said had nothing to back them up, so therefore they couldn't be true. I had so many thoughts and I remember thinking, oh, I wish I could just jump into that video. <laughs> Show him that that's simply not true, that there are so many things that back up all of the claims he was making to try to prove that the Book of Mormon doesn't have a leg to stand on. I have put out so many videos over the years that address these very topics, and so I thought, when am I going to have time for this? <laughs> when am I going to have time to comb through all of my past videos and try to find these sound bites that were all coming to mind as I was watching this video? It kind of reminds me of the scriptures. You know those moments when you're experiencing something in life or someone needs your advice and all of a sudden a scripture just comes to mind. And if you're me, <laughs> usually you can't remember which book, which chapter, which verse, but you know the scripture and those words are there. Well, that's how I felt about this video, about things that I know to be true and exciting discoveries that back that up that were dismissed in this debate. Well, I just realized I didn't have my microphone. <laughs> so, sorry about that. The sound's gonna change right about now. But anyways, these were things that were left out of the debate. In fact, I even commented down below on this video. It took a few days for that comment to get approved and show up, but I pointed out some of the things that were missing that should have been brought up in this debate that would have taken it to a whole new level. But since that didn't happen, thank goodness for YouTube channels, <laughs> because I have gone ahead and found some of those sound bites from past videos that I've done, and I put those together in conjunction with sound bites from this debate. If I had time, there is so much more I would add to this video, but for sake of time, I'm going to keep it pretty short, at least by happy lady standards. <laughs> now, if you know me, you also know I'm not one to debate. Way back in the day, while going to college, I learned that I was really good at sales because I always had a good rebuttal. Anytime a customer came at me and said, well, I don't know about this or that, I knew just the right thing to say to address those concerns and put their mind at ease. And that skill raised me to the top of the ranks at every place where I worked. And I'm going to say that's probably an ADHD superpower <laughs> because my mind is always going and I can think fast on my feet. If I'm ever put on the spot, I generally don't freeze up 
my mind doesn't go blank. Usually it's the opposite when I'm put on the spot or I'm under pressure, under a time crunch. That's when I can hyper focus. <laughs> and the filing cabinet in the back of my mind opens up and all these files just start flying out and lots of things come to the front of my mind. So this is something I talk about in my book, Successful Failures. In fact, that's a book I'm going to be reading from on my other channel, The Happy House. We took a break for a while after the last book, but that one is next in the queue. That book is sort of like a biography of all of the lessons I had learned in life up until that point, all the failures I had experienced and how I felt those failures were actually success in disguise. So anyways, if that's your kind of thing, if that's something that you're interested in, go ahead and head over to my other channel, The Happy House, and be sure to subscribe so you get notified when videos come out over there. For those of you who are new to my channel, that's sort of a place where I invite you in to my home, into my personal world, and we talk about things outside of things we talk about on this channel. <laughs> so if you like both, I invite you to subscribe to both channels. If you're here just for the spiritual meat and the history mystery videos, you'll find all of that here. And if you want all that extra stuff, go ahead and find me over there. But anyways, I'm usually one who likes to avoid contention. Oftentimes, debating does just that. It pulls in some of that contention, puts you in that defensive mode. And it's always been my experience that when you're in defensive mode, it's sometimes hard to bring in the spirit. Anytime we feel the need to prove something, oftentimes it never ends up convincing anyone. But when we share experiences and we testify of things that we know are true, what we believe and why those things matter to us. And we do that joyfully with love, kindness, and respect. That often produces conversations and dialogue that cultivates the spirit. And it's the spirit that does the teaching and bears witness of truth. That's been my experience. But anyways, who doesn't love a good debate, right? <laughs> Anyways, if you know me, you know I love these topics. I love to deep dive into history, archaeology, ancient cultures and civilizations, and I love to follow those breadcrumbs and piece those puzzle pieces together. So we're going to do a little bit of that in today's video. And if you like what you see, you like what you hear, I will have links down below to those videos where I pull the sound bites from so you can watch them in their entirety. Okay, well I put these sound bites together for you. So without further ado, let's go ahead and play them. Hope you enjoy. In spite of all its geographical references, Mormons only know the events in the Book of Mormon took place somewhere in North and South America. Some Mormons say they took place in Central America. Others say as far away as the Great Lakes or the American heartland. That would be like the Iroquois, the Cherokee believe that the ancient people landed in what is the Yucatan Peninsula or Mayan Indian area. From there, they migrated northward then again into a southerly direction. This is the route followed after they left the southlands of the Yucatan. The migration northward took the Cherokee, actually the people, because they believed they were one people at the time and they had not yet divided into groups, into the area of what is now New York, near the place of waters called Lake Erie. As they arrived in this area, which is now northern New York, they found a light-skinned people who already possessed the land. The Cherokee people befriended these light-skins and dwelt among them. These light-skins were a mighty and a great people. The Cherokee believe that they were the true forefathers of all the Indians who had come from the east across the waters riding in white clouds. The Book of Mormon is a record of the forefathers of our western tribes of Indians. By it we learn that our western tribes of Indians are descendants from that Joseph who was sold into Egypt and that the land of America 
as a promised land unto them. The principal nation of the second race fell in battle towards the close of the fourth century. The remnant are the Indians that now inhabit this country. Joseph standing in Nauvoo, America, United States of America. You want to get more on Joseph? Here's where you find it. All these stories will give you a whole bunch of information on Joseph. So when we say conflict, it's confusing to us that people can exp can understand that you can walk from Rome on the Silk Road to China, but that we weren't walking from the Great Lakes to Central America down to the Amazon and having trading networks. And that what happened when, where did the Spanish go? They went straight to the center of that trading network and shut it off. And, and so that's part of the problem. And our people did trade with the uh, Anas, other people. And as I mentioned before, they were here for a very brief period of time. And the uh, teaching of the Anas is that they came from the south. It was over a period of time that, that they came from the south, whether they came from the land areas across the uh, Sonora Desert into, into the southwest. They don't uh, give some particular location, but there's also the other routes and that that were taken by later people, Spaniards particularly, up the Rio Grande or up the Colorado from the, uh, the Baja area now. But uh, it was that they came from the south and uh, some of the stories in that that talk about them eventually uh, locating themselves in what later became uh, Chaco Canyon. But even then, our people say that there were already people there, that they were uh, a group of people that actually had th that place, and it was a central place for all of the other uh, Pueblo uh, groups of people in the Southwest. It was sort of a center for a trade, uh, trade routes. And so the Anasaza saw that, and that's what they took first. They captured the people and, and uh, gained control of the area that is known as uh, Chaco. And from there, they, uh, of course, uh, took advantage of the many other Pueblo uh, groups and families and so on. And the only thing that kept them separate from the Dene was the Dene were very numerous and the Anasaza would not uh, try to control the uh, people known as Dene. The Navajo are believed to have initially migrated from Western Canada where they belong to a group of Native Americans called the Athabascans. 600 BC, we figured they probably got here about 590, 5, 589, coming by boat. Anthropologists believe that the Navajo split off from the southern Athabascans and migrated to the southwest as early as 200 AD. Now it has to be understood, but the Dene, as a society of people, when they first came out here, they were fleeing from a disputes and that, and just so many disagreements that were among those people. And so they broke away and they came west. When our people came here into the greater portion of this part of the continent and now recognized as the Southwest, our people came from the east across the great rivers and as they came across they ended up into what is present day southern Colorado and as they talk about in the traditional teaching they say there were already people here there were a lot of different people we cannot deny scientifically that there were people here probably millions of people Estimate. of course 385 that is the final battle when everything is over and in 421 Moroni says farewell right now, let's take a look at the Hopewell timeline. 550 BC. Every archaeologist, no matter what state you talk to, will tell you the Hopewell are over by 400 AD. Now, isn't that remarkable? Look how well that fits. But that's even not the best news. The best news is this. We didn't do the work. They did all of this, non-LDS, academics, and that's terrific. Good news for us. References the saying the Fremont people, the Mugion people, there are many other people in that, that sometimes people say, we don't know what happened to them, they vanished. They did not vanish, they became the Neh. And so it was that the, the people that were known as the Neh, there were many of them. In fact, some people say there was as many as maybe one and a half million of people that became the Neh. 
And they were the greatest number for Kappa later. Group X. And so then the question is, how does it get here? And of course, we know that it was by ship. We're told in Helaman, the Lord brought Mulek into the land north, and he brought Lehi into the land south. And for me, that's pretty plain. I can tell you, I, I have a whole talk just on Mulek. I can follow Mulek right into the St. Lawrence Seaway, and it's backed up by the Native Americans that live there, primarily the Ojibwa and the Potawatomi. And Lehi landed in the state of Florida, and you can take that same route. It'll bring you right up to the Gulf. Either you go into the Gulf or you go right up the east side of North America and into the St. Lawrence. These two cultures here are called uh, the Deptford phase. This is the oldest Hopewell location in North America, and it's in Florida. It's the oldest. So if it's the oldest, I'm going to look here for Lehi. Europeans want to tell us where we came from, when we came here, and they forget Montezuma himself. When they came to Central America, said that even they came from across the water. By ship. And, uh, but nobody has ever asked our story. Europe. I'm looking at this here, and when I saw this, this was my aha moment. We arrived this morning in the banks of the Mississippi. We left the eastern part of the state of Ohio, wandering over the plains of the Nephites, recounting occasionally the history of the Book of Mormon, roving over the mounds of that once beloved people of the Lord, picking up their skulls and bones as proof of its divine authenticity, signed Joseph Smith, Jr. I got to tell you guys, when I read this, after 18 years of study, in the church, this area where Joseph just walked across, identifying the plains was the turf for the Hopewell Nation. This was their home. And this is where I have been spending all my time. My the Hopewell are considered the ancestors of several federally recognized tribes in Ohio, including the Chippewa, Delaware, Kickapoo, Miami, Ottawa, Peoria, Potawatomi, Seneca, Shawnee, and Wyandot. Now, when I hear the name Hope Well, a couple of scriptures come to mind. This first one here in Isaiah chapter 12, starting in verse 3. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day shall ye say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. And Moroni chapter 7 verse 1 And now I, Moroni, write a few things of the words of my father Mormon, which he spake concerning faith, hope, and charity. For after this manner did he speak unto the people, as he taught them in the synagogue which they had built for the place of worship. Wherefore I would speak unto you that are of the church, that are the peaceable followers of Christ, and that have obtained a sufficient hope by which ye can enter into the rest of the Lord, from this time henceforth until ye shall rest with him in heaven. For behold, a bitter fountain cannot bring forth good water, neither can a good fountain bring forth bitter water. Wherefore, a man, being a servant of the devil, cannot follow Christ, and if he follow Christ, he cannot be a servant of the devil. This is a message from the ancient prophets of the Book of Mormon to the people of this day on this land and all over the world, that we find hope in the living water of the well of salvation. The hope is in the well, and the well is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Mound builders, there's three, three principal types. Late Archary Kadena, that's where you're going to find your Jaredites. Uh, his your grandmother, he said, was from the Turtle Tribe, and they were called that because they had come over on the backs of turtle shells to this land. And then he had this other story with it, and I was like, hey, could I hear more about that? Their ancient ancestors came from across the ocean in boats that were shaped like turtle shells. And then they have these drawings, and I've seen it where they have like little boats, and they're tight like into a dish. <laughs> And they call them turtle shells, but they're totally, the description of them is of the Jaredites, barges, right? So anyway, I was really 
interested in this and wanted to hear about the story and where exactly this turtle tribe was from. And he said, oh, they're from Cambridge, Maryland area, which is really cool because a couple of years ago, I saw an article about how there were Adena mounds found in Cambridge, Maryland. That's somewhat close to where my mom grew up. So I had written her about it. It was like, hey, did you ever see this? The Adena people are the Jaredites. Like they co- totally coincide with the Jaredite people and their timeline and, and all that stuff. And she'd been like, oh, I actually lived in Cambridge, Maryland for like three months during a rotation in nursing school. We had talked about this. And so it was really cool because this lady with um, her tribe had this ancient tradition of coming over and on turtle shells and there they were where there's Adena mounds like where there's Jaredite archaeological sites being excavated right now that's where her tribe was from your Hopewell 550 to 400 AD that's where you're going to find your Nephites, Mulekites, and Lamanites because Jesus Christ the great peacemaker came to this continent and not only that but before that Jews from Jerusalem came to this continent and not only that People from the Tower of Babel came to this continent. And not just one group of Jews came when the temple was being des- destroyed by the Babylonians, but a couple groups. Don't forget the Mulekites. The Book of Mormon talks about Mulek, who brought over a group of people known as the Mulekites. Mulek was the surviving son of King Zedekiah at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. Are there additional records outside of the Book of Mormon that talk about Mulek and his people coming to this land, America? And do we know who his modern-day descendants are? But uh, we had a boat that froze in the water, and uh, and uh, for an entire moon, 30 days, they stayed on it, and, uh, and I know the location, but they surrounded the little bay area off the St. Lawrence River, and they made a circle of fire, the, the Anishinaabe did, and then uh, the people came off. And when they came off, it was elders, old, older men with three children, two girls and a boy. And uh, the boy was older, and, uh, but when they came off, the, uh, the, the head elder, he had pulled out of his bag two little antlers and he put it on his head. Mm-hmm. Now, that was a symbol that he must have known about us because the deer family followed the the caribou family followed the caribou they made the big trails through nature and around the world the highways and freeways other than the rivers that people followed and he knew well enough that he was telling the people we need to speak to these people and so they called the the ogima of the adiktu dem who came and they met in peace and they brought the lodge to us which is called middu it's the path of kindness established by the first father and everything is about the first mother and father that is when people want to know the spiritual teachings. It is about the creation of the earth. It is about understanding your spirit and the body and about the first mother and father. Yep. The, the boy was taken by the elders through all of our communities and he was the greatest teacher that the elders had taught him and he taught us. And he has helped establish the lodge and then he left with the elders. The, the two girls were given to the two sons of the Adik uh, Ogima and that's the birth of the Moose Durum was at that point and then we became the only two of the first seven clans all the way till present day that uh, are matrilineal descent because of that with each of the the daughters that tied to these two star women women of the star uh, 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 called that title as well now we know that they gave us a symbol of the lodge which is an eight-pointed star drawn by drawing two sticks that are connected in all directions and when you draw that in the lodge, you actually make two st- two overlapping stars of David. You'd also call it the, the symbol of Melchizedek. When the Europeans were here with the Hudson Bay Company, they recorded it, that they met three sisters, the three sisters of Chief Red Bear, the three sisters that all their names in Assiniboine, Ojibwe, and uh, Cree, OG Cree, means woman of the star. And that's Machi Quiance, to call me good, Unitino Wasis, which is my grandmother's line, which is the principal line. All of these are my grandmothers through my great grandfather and great grandmother because they we merged the lines with also Chief Red Bear. We did things like that to keep things together. And so we come from those people. And and that's who I would say that I'm Anishinaabe, Deer Clan, but I'm also from the people of the star. We presented this story with our head elders, not me alone 
but with our principal elders who run the lodges, uh, to the top Jewish rabbis from the Jewish Learning Institute, the National Committee for the Furtherance of Jewish Education, the uh, rabbinical councils that and we know rabbinical councils in the Jewish faith, you can't even get married. You can't get divorced. They handle civil matters. The rabbinical councils, uh, uh, the yeshiva, the, the yeshiva out of Jerusalem, they were all there and they signed a proclamation with me that declared that we were the same as them. <laughs> that we come wow. from them. Our people came from over there in a couple migrations, specifically when the great house of the Lord fell initially. Now, the rabbis in their proclamation that worked with us for two years, they felt that so confident in that after spending time with us and getting to know us. This is the Shabbat Orthodox Hasidic, the most hardcore to the, they, they, the, to the T, that they actually had it typed into the proclamation they signed where they stated that our teachings came to us 2,500 years ago, 600 BC. So we know who we are, and I know that I come from that sacred bloodline, and I call them brothers. And then you've got so. the later group that comes much later, the Mississippian, post Book of Mormon. Notice that Hopewell ends at 400 AD, and these guys begin at 900 AD. Why the gap? What's going on in North America? What happened after the Nephites were destroyed? We had a dark ages, continual warfare. The victors now fell upon themselves to fight for who's gonna control everything and what lands, etc., etc. And what's going on in Europe at 400 AD? Dark ages, same thing, very interesting. So there's the Hopewell time period, and then they got, like they just suddenly disappeared around 400, 450 AD, and then um, a new period starts where people were like trying to copy the methods of the Hopewell people because they were such a great civilization. They couldn't quite get it there, so they just kind of copied a lot of things that they had done. The archaeologists can tell a huge difference between the two societies. Um, for one, um, the Hopewell had like a great network of cities where it was like a nation, like a group of people united by the cultural and religious beliefs. Whereas um, once they just were suddenly gone. Um, they call it the Mississippian time period started, and it's right around this time period too. And I wonder, because it was during that time like that I think the Aztec people came up and they took over a ton of the tribes of the southern United States and made them into slaves. They started building structures that looked like the temples down in Mexico, but they were making them out of dirt and they are making the slaves build them. Anyway, and there's one today in, I think it's called Coweta, Georgia, and then there's one in St. Louis. It's the really big one. So it's really interesting. And now, now I'm wondering if that's why the people came up and took over in the southern United States, all those people. Maybe it coincided with this as well. Sometime after the Dene first arrived in the area here, uh, some 2,000 years ago, they began to migrate down into this part of the, uh, the continent. And right now we are just uh, west of uh, present-day Cortez, Colorado and uh, east of uh, Blanding and Monticello, Utah. Strong in the Cherokee beliefs is the remembrance of one called Itza. This reminds me of the ancient city Chichen Itza in Mexico, which I have visited, which came about after the destruction of the Nephites, of the Lord's covenant people. The events of his life and death tell that Itza died on a cross on a skull mountain. He wore a red robe, which was made by a Cherokee woman. Upon his head, he wore thistles or thorns and died for the Cherokee people. It is believed by the Cherokee that Itza is Jesus. This great chief, son of Skyworld, climbed a hill called Death Face Hill. There he hung for the Cherokee people, his side opened by an arrow. As in Mexico and elsewhere, this light or bright ancestor figured in some of their legends as a white man who in some remote time visited them from the east and brought them their civilization. I was so excited when I came across these legends because to me, they very much parallel what we read in the book of 3rd Nephi chapter 11 when the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, visits the people living on the American continent. So again, we have this word East. 
this white man, full of light, who comes from the east, clothed in the brightness of day, in whom all the things of the earth belong. And he comes and he teaches them. He teaches them his gospel. He helps them thrive and become prosperous and happy. And they called him the Great Hair or the White One. The Book of Mormon is a history related primitive church. One may well ask what kind of remains the Nephites will leave us from their more primitive, virtuous days. A closer approximation to the Book of Mormon picture of Nephite culture is seen in the earth and palisade structures of the Hopewell and Adena culture areas than in the later stately piles of stone of Mesoamerica. Dr. Nibley. But behold, this land, said God, shall be a land of thine inheritance, and the Gentiles shall be blessed upon the land, and this land shall be a land of liberty unto the Gentiles, and there shall be no kings upon the land who shall raise up unto the Gentiles, and I will fortify this land against all other nations. Yahweh was a unity of three beings. Just as in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, we have the Godhead, three individual beings who are united in one purpose, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the silence in the archeological record is deafening. In there, I, I carry four scrolls that there's eight portions. You can say eight scrolls, four scrolls. And, and, and they tell the story of the first people. And on top of this mountain is a flat stone surface. And there are stones stacked in circles where the earth and moss between them is petrified. The question is, why are these things not known outside of our communities? We also know we stacked bodies in mountains when they covered the earth after our civil war. And we also threw, a, threw all of our, our weapons into a hole under a tree, into a creek and a river when we, when we chose the path of peace. So rather than shed the blood of their brethren, they would rather give up their own lives. And when they did this, they decided to dig a hole in the earth and bury all of their weapons. Now this line is really interesting because it says, thus we see that they buried their weapons of peace, or they buried the weapons of war for peace. And I thought, what in the world are weapons of peace? That's kind of an oxymoron, right? Well, if you think about it, a weapon is a tool for killing. But there's also other tools that we use for other things. So what would be a tool that they would have used for peace? Might that have been a peace pipe? Something they would smoke with? It makes sense that they would have buried all things that reminded them of their former life as Lamanites. And what's the best way to symbolize breaking a former alliance or covenant? Well, that would be to break something in half, sort of like tearing up a contract. But they had this one little tiny mound, it was just a little one, and they had a plaque and it said, like, we're so confused, but instead of finding bodies when we dug this up, we found all these smoking pipes. And um, just like they found pits with weapons, buried in them. So why did they bury 200 smoking pipes in here? And they had broken them in half. They broke them before they buried them in here. Was this some kind of ritual? Like, what were they doing? They couldn't understand it. And I just thought, oh, the word of wisdom. Oh my goodness. You know, like, of course they were being taught the word of wisdom. So, you know, and it, like, as after the Savior left, he left them prophet and apostles and who would have received the revelation. And, and just like Joseph Smith did, the same pattern of how things happen and stuff. So anyway, you guys, it was just so cool. Like every place we have gone um, that we went to with these mounds and these different things, it was constant evidence of the Book of Mormon that yes, it did happen here. We're going to see the indigenous histories interact with one another and agree. So if these histories are mythological, they're made up or they're exaggerated, how come they tell the same story? How can they agree? I don't think you can do that except if they're both independently true. We haven't even found a single example of Hebrew or Egyptian script that should be in the New World if the Book of Mormon were true. This comes from the cave of the Potawatomi. They'll tell you this is a sacred symbol to them and it belongs to their ancient ancestors. In the archaeological record, this has been labeled a fanciful pitchfork. That's the stuff we have to deal with in the Midwest. Cyrus Gordon in America was a leading epigrapher of his time. Also well respected in Europe and Asia and the Middle East, anywhere. A friend of his, Henriette Mertz, saw a picture of this stone, which is called the Bat Creek Stone. Comes out of Cherokee country. 
The bones that were with it have already been dated. There were nine people buried with it, 100 to 300 AD. It's right in that area, Book of Mormon timeline. And the way you're looking at it right now, they call it Cherokee script. But what you're looking at is upside down Paleo Hebrew. Cyrus Gordon translated it. He says, right now, all it says is for Judah because the one end has been busted off. And when he got done doing that, the Smithsonian put it back on display upside down and said Cherokee alphabet. This is a Jewish shekel from Jerusalem, 68, 72 AD, but all of the letters on that coin match the letters on the stone. There's a reverse now of the coins. You can see the letters that are on the coin. Look at the letters. Are they not the same? This also was found uh, in Ohio, about 12 miles from the octagon in the largest stone mound of North America. The stone has covered the front, sides, and the back with the Ten Commandments. This here was championed by good old Orson Pratt, who gave a talk on it in volume 13 of the Journal of Discourses. I got to Rome, and I was going through Rome in the museum. This is upstairs in the Vatican. And I'm walking along, and I see these two stones really caught my attention. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those and bring them forward really big. And then I'm going to put that Ohio stone right smack in the middle. And I want you to compare. Is that not a parallel? They are made the same. They look the same. They possibly are the same. In 37 to 39, a lot of flooding in the Tennessee Valley. The federal government says, okay, we're going to build dams all over. We're going to stop this flooding. And so the farmers had to make sure they're on the high ground, and they took care of that. But that whole Tennessee Valley is covered with Hopewell and Adena burial mounds. They allowed academia to come into the Tennessee Valley and dig anywhere they want, without even asking, because everything is going to be underwater. It's going to be gone. Covered Flooded. in water. Underwater. So they went wild down there, like kids in a candy store. I mean, they were digging everywhere. But up at a place where it would be called yeah. the Norris Dam area become the Norris Dam Project. They dig down a Mississippian mound, and now these guys build mounds on top of each other, just like in Israel, we call them tells, one on top of another. Mississippian layer, a second layer was an earlier Mississippian layer, and they got to the bottom layer of this mound. They uncovered a Hopewell mound, and in that mound, they found a rectangular structure laid out with posts that they could still see piles of stone inside that were all collapsed. They find all this, and they went and got a hold of a guy in London, England, an Egyptologist by the name of Rendell Harris. They gave Harris all this information from this strange building in this Hopewell Mound. He comes back and says, it looks like the first steps of an Egyptian temple. A temple in Tennessee? <laughs> really? Interesting. He said, not only is it potentially Egyptian, he says, look at the names. Tennessee is an Egyptian word. Tenna means land of, Essie means Isis. Tennessee translated in Egyptian means land of Isis. And then all the rivers are Egyptian names down in Tennessee to the south. I mean, he, this guy just went on. An Egyptologist out of London. Do you find him in our history books? They couldn't get this guy back to England quick enough. G.E. Kincaid explored the underground complex for several hours. Then he came across another large room, a crypt. The crypt had shelf upon shelf and row upon row of mummies, dozens of them. At this point, G.E. Kincaid realized that if he was going to explore this entire underground city, he was going to need help. G.E. Kincaid sent a few artifacts to the Smithsonian along with his notes of what he found. He requested financial and logistical support for what he felt was the most significant archaeological discovery ever made. The Smithsonian agreed. A few weeks later, Professor S.A. Jordan arrived with a team of about 40 scientists, researchers, and laborers to excavate and explore the ancient underground city. Now with more lights and manpower, the scientists realized that the cave system layout wasn't random. It was a symmetrical, deliberate design. This was a huge city lived in by thousands of men, women, and children for hundreds or possibly thousands of years. The question nobody could answer was, who were they? Thousands of artifacts were found. They found swords and shields made of copper, bronze, and a gray metal that scientists couldn't identify. They thought it looked like platinum. They found pottery, urns, utensils for cooking, small yellow stones called cat's eyes, and large stone tablets, all engraved with hieroglyphics. On all the urns or walls over doorways and tablets of stone which were found by the image are the mysterious hieroglyphics, the key to which the Smithsonian Institute hopes yet to discover. The engraving on the tablets probably has something to do with the religion of the people. 
Similar hieroglyphics have been found in southern Arizona. Among the Pitori writings, only two animals are found. One is of prehistoric type. Even with all the relics and all the writing Kincaid and Jordan found, they were still no closer to determining who built the citadel in the Grand Canyon. This now lost civilization worked bronze many years before the Bronze Age began. They understood division of labor and agriculture when every other society on Earth was presumably still hunting and gathering. These are discoveries that went against everything that was taught in mainstream archaeology and anthropology. A civilization like this shouldn't exist. These people were technologically advanced, educated, skilled, and spiritually complex. And these people originated somehow in Egypt or Asia. It is the Hopi people who are associated with emerging from the Grand Canyon. The name Hopi translates to people who live in the correct way. And the full name translates to peaceful people. In 1951, Helen, who was a member of the Hopi tribe, was introduced to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by the first full-time missionaries, a senior couple in Oribi. Many of the church's teachings made sense to Helen and coincided with Hopi beliefs. While Helen was growing up, Helen's father had instructed her to forgive, serve others, and share with those in need. Her mother had taught her the Hopi Moral Code, which was to keep herself morally clean before marriage and to be true to her husband after she was married. Like Latter-day Saints, Hopis believe in eternal marriage. When she and Emery read the Book of Mormon, they believed it to be true because it sounded like a familiar story and reminded them of the Hopi tradition. After studying the gospel for two years, Helen and two of her children were baptized by her son Wayne, who had been converted in Phoenix. About becoming a Latter-day Saint, Helen wrote, I have no doubt I did right. I have never been sorry. It has made a better woman of me. And I have surely been happy in my church. I have had great satisfaction working in the church, even though it seemed like everything was against me at times. When our people first came here, they knew that the Pueblo people were here. And they also knew that there was another separate group of people that they called the Cliff Dwellers. And the Cliff Dwellers are the ones that are very important to the uh, history of our Dene, because it's understood that most all of them, if not all of them, of those that were the cliff dwelling people came to be the Neh. The Pueblo people became easy prey to the Inasaza and they were enslaved. Everything today, when people see any kind of cliff dwelling or any type of uh, Pueblo structure and that, they want to say immediately, Anasazi. That is so very wrong. And it is something that is should be corrected. The walls were there in many cases, people don't understand, is not to keep people out, but to keep people in. And it was that there were serious punishments for some of these slaves on that. They were mistreated and uh, subjected to torture and hunger and all kinds of ways in that to make them obedient. The people that they're held as slaves, they all ran off, they abandoned the Inasaza. And those people went and hid and joined other uh, groups of people away from the the uh, Anasazi. The uh, teaching of our people is that when the Anasazi were destroyed, they were completely destroyed. There was not any Anasazi left. To this day, there's no such pe people as descendants of Anasazi. Plus, the Book of Mormon contains things we know did not exist in ancient America, and these anachronisms are nothing like what is alleged in Scripture. For example, it describes horses and chariots, even though there were no chariots, and horses were introduced after Christopher Columbus. Dr. Jones did a real good job. Him and two other professors went after the horse bones of the uh, to datum, and they found out they had plenty of horse bones show up between 600 BC to 1481. Supposedly, the horses all died out at 10,000 BC. That's, that's what's taught. And they're saying, no, 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 no. We got horse bones at 6,000 BC. They made it through the Ice Age. And of course, we got horses showing up with the Native Americans at 1481 AD, which means the Spanish did not bring the horses here. Okay? Now, Jones tried to put this report out through farms, and they refused to publish it. Otherwise, you guys would have had this about 1980, 81. 
But I got him to publish it in Ancient American, and there it is. And by a miracle, this was allowed to be published in the Smithsonian Magazine. It says, The narrative about horses in North America told in several written histories is due for an update, according to a study published last week in the journal Science. After examining archaeological remains of horses, researchers suggest indigenous peoples had spread the animals through the American West by the first half of the 1600s, before they encountered Europeans. The findings align with oral histories from indigenous groups which tell of interactions with horses prior to colonizers arriving in their homelands. Meanwhile, written European texts from the 1700s and 1800s claim that horses only spread through the area after the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, a Native American uprising that temporarily expelled Spanish colonizers from much of modern New Mexico. More than 80 scientists and scholars co-authored the paper, including experts from Pueblo, Pawnee, Comanche, and Lakota nations, according to an article in The Conversation by two of the authors. We have always known and said that we came across horses before we came across the Spanish. Jimmy Arterberry, a paper co-author and Comanche historian, tells Christina Larson of the Associated Press. And in the journal of Lewis and Clark, when they are dying of starvation, and finally they meet the Native Americans out on the West Coast, they tell us that when the first time they see them, the Indians speak and they've got their translator, Sacagawea, and she tells them that they are telling her that they, Lewis and Clark, are the first white men they have ever seen. And while they're doing that, they're sitting on horses. That's in their diary, horseback. Archaeologists and other scholars have long probed the hemisphere's past, and the society does not know of anything found so far that has substantiated the Book of Mormon. Indeed, the idea that Native Americans were the descendants of ancient Jews who emigrated to the Americas was a common one in the 19th century. That disproves Smith's claim that, quote, Smith said this, Our Western tribes of Indians are descendants from that Joseph which was sold into Egypt. You don't have to live by faith if it's a fact. There's one thing that needs to be settled right now, once and for all, and that's that the Book of Mormon is not a fairy tale. It's an actual historical fact that relates to the Anishinaabe peoples. I think I've interviewed over 35 tribes, like representatives from 35 tribes in the past year. And uh, they feel that identity as children of the Book of Mormon there's definitely a pride in being children of Father Lehi. The Book of Mormon would be the first large book that I had ever read from cover to cover. When I finished the entire book, I knelt down and prayed. At that moment, I had my first very strong spiritual experience. It seemed to me that the Book of Mormon was about my Pawnee Indian ancestors. The Book of Mormon talks about a people the Lamanites, who would be scattered, smitten, and nearly destroyed. But in the end, they would be blessed if they followed the Savior. That is exactly what I saw in my own family history. When I read the Book of Mormon, it gave me very positive feelings about who I am, a knowledge that Heavenly Father had something for me to accomplish in life, and how I could be an instrument in his hands in serving the needs of other people. I um, had a 40-year government career, and 35 years of that was in uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I was the regional director for the eastern region of the Bureau, wow. and I served 28 yeah. tribes, federally recognized tribes in that area, ranging from Maine down to Florida, over to Louisiana, federally recognized, and I myself am a uh, Chickasaw and Choctaw from Oklahoma. I opened the Book of Mormon, read the first verse. I knew for the first sentence that it was true. I was baptized. So. In the beginning of Book of Mormon, it tells you this book is written to the Lamanite. 
And so when I first started reading the book, they say, hey, that's talking to me. That's uh, addressed to me as a Native American. You want to talk about the Lamanites and Nephites? Learn a little bit about the Anishinaabe and the Iroquois Haudenosaunee. And also about the great peacemaker who bought peace between us. Their principal god has always been the speaker of peace. Hastiyakhtir is what we call that being. And then the other ones, there are 12 of those, and they call Hastiyakhtir is uh, the way they say it. Hastiyakhtir. That means have people that will teach you peace in the home. And so it was a very peaceful society of uh, people that the Dene, the early Dene, were. And it was that uh, they were peacemakers. And so they also were peacekeepers. Was Joseph Smith wrong when he said, our Western tribes of Indians are descendants from that Joseph which was sold into Egypt, even though 99.5% of Native American DNA comes from Asia, not the Middle East. So when it comes to DNA, if there were really a lot of people here, and Lehi group was very small, and there was, as it looks like from this Book of Mormon passages that we talk about it, some sort of uh, admixture, intermingling, their DNA would have disappeared within five or six generations. Because after that becomes too diluted. You don't have all your ancestral DNA with you. They're, the majority of your ancestors are not genetically represented in you. Scientists didn't want to believe it, but they found a new haplogroup in addition to A, B, C, D uh, among the uh, Indians of the Great Lakes in particular. And that was haplogroup X. Here, finally, the mystery of haplogroup X was uh, revealed in a, in a very important study by a team under Dr. Schluss. And he determined without, without any doubt that the origin of haplogroup X was the hills of Galilee. It was that clear. Because where you have the greatest concentration and the greatest diversity, that's the origin. Well, and if you start talking about haplogroup X, you'll always have some people pop up and they'll say, no, 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 a haplogroup X was Asian. To me, it's really clear it came from the Middle East. And it's because that's where you find the greatest diversity of it. So that means it's been there the longest, right? Yep. And the highest concentrations of it, it would right indicate there. the source of it. Not only that, but when you look at the Native Americans and their closest relative, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the Middle East. So you probably know the, the mainstream theory for how the Native Americans came over is they came over from Asia across the land bridge. That's the Beringian origin. But when they looked at haplogroup X, they're not finding that. They did not find it anywhere along that path. And so it's like, it was there in the Middle East. We find it in a few other places. But In his book, Native Israelites, The Search for Joseph of Egypt's Genetics Among the Native Americans, author Alexander T. Paulos shows through photographs the similarities of genetics between modern day Native Americans compared to Israelis and Jews. But not just from the tribe of Manasseh, but also the tribe of Ephraim. Now here is a map of traced DNA of the Jaredite people or Adena people and the Nephite people or Hopewell people. So you can see over in Europe and the Middle East and also over in North America and Canada. So this is haplogroup X. And where it's red, that's where it shows the greatest density. So we see this connection of the Jaredite people who left Babylon and Lehi's people who left Jerusalem and how they came to the New World. They came to the North American continent. In spite of all its geographical references, Mormons only know the events in the Book of Mormon took place somewhere in North and South America, as far away as the Great Lakes of the American heartland. Uh, they like seem to primarily stay in the northeastern regions around the Great Lakes and into Canada. But there's plenty of evidence that the Hopewell arose while the Adena were declining, and the two groups may have mixed a bit. So this parallels the Jaredites and the Nephites. The Hopewell generally built their astrological mounds on top of Adena ones. In the Book of Mormon, you can see the Mulekites mixed a bit with the Jaredites. Mitochondrial DNA X has shown up in Hopewell graves. I think it was 25% of Hopewell graves in Ohio had haplogroup X. Oh. 
it is expected that the ancient record to the tribes must come through the religious leaders. The people will receive it if the medicine men agree unitedly. Yeah, I, I met a young uh, Apache missionary once, and his father was a medicine man. And he was on his mission whenever I talked to this young man. And he said he had seen his father do miraculous things as a medicine man. And he discussed religion with his father. He talked about the church to his father. And his dad said, yeah, it's true. If you knew what you had, you would not trifle with it. And he said, well, if you know these things, the truth of my church, why don't you join it? And he, as a medicine man, said, I've made my choice. My, my dad was the first one. He's, he's a medicine person. He told me, he says, son, don't come back. I only have that much. You have the fullness. You have everything. And then he predicted, he says, I believe that you will be the key to gathering a lot, not just a few, a lot. And he said they'll see it as the full, not part. Joseph Smith's father was Joseph Smith Sr., but he had an uncle named Azel Smith Jr. And his daughter, Martha Smith, was baptized and confirmed by Hiram Smith and her cousin Hiram Smith and David Whitmer. And and that and she married the, the an Indian. That that is one family through my mother, and uh, and John Taylor is through my grandfather, my mother's fa uh, father. He was the third great grandchild of of John Taylor, uh, who was a prophet in the church. And I carry his journals, and so I have that side of my family that growing up was giving me a book and saying, "Here's the history of your other side of your family." which was my father and his family is the most renowned Native American family in, in Anishinaabeg Algonquin history from the very beginning. And so trying to reconcile those was the journey of my life, that one side is saying that uh, the Jesus Christ appeared on this continent and established the gospel on this continent and it went away. And then this side is saying, and it was restored and if that's true, remnants should exist. And so I, I became a member of the church. I was married in a temple. I had children under covenant. Now on our trip, one of the stops was Mackinac Island. And my mom had told me, you know, do some research on the island because it has such a cool history. I decided to go way back to the origins of the island. And I had a feeling I would find something really awesome if I did. Just off of it is an island called Mackinac Island with a, with a mountain called Sugarloaf Rock that's sacred to us because we say that on the seventh day, the Creator rested there. Where was the place before the flood? We were. Every Anishinaabeg, every Algonquin, we know that's the place. And this was just from the Wikipedia, but it says the island is a sacred place in the tradition of some of its earliest known inhabitants the Anishinaabe peoples. They consider it to be home of the Great Spirit. According to legend, Mackinac Island was created by the Great Hare Michibu. You guys, that stood out to me, the Great Hare. Remember, I talked about that in recent videos. The video where I talk about 2023 being the year of the Great Hare, the year of the rabbit, and then how I came across that book from the 1800s. I started reading it. It was all about Native American history. And I come across this legend of this Great Hare. And it talked about how this being from heaven visited these people and he healed their sick gave sight to the blind, taught them his ways, and said that he would return again someday and gave them signs to look for to know of his return. And right away when I read that, I knew that that great white hare or rabbit was our Savior, Jesus Christ, which lines up with the events in the Book of Mormon. It's so incredible. So I talked about that in that video, 2023, the year of the Lord. This island that we were about to visit off the shore of Michigan was home to the Great Spirit. And according to legend, this island was created by the Great Hare. 
and was the first land to appear after the great flood had receded. So, where was the place before the flood? We were every Anishinaabeg, every Algonquin. We know that's the place. Yeah. The word Anishinaabe translates to people from whence lowered. Another definition refers to the good humans. So these were the good people. Again, it reminds me of 3 Nephi chapter 11, when our Savior Jesus Christ in his resurrected form visits the American continent and all of the people living here at that time. He heals their sick, gives sight to the blind, and teaches them his ways, and also gives them signs to look for his return. And we read in the Book of Mormon that never on the face of the earth was there ever a happier people that existed than those people of 3rd Nephi chapter 11. So these people, the Anishinaabe, were called the good humans. They were known as the good people. They had that reputation. And it said that this means the good humans meant those who are on the right road or path given to them by the Creator or the Great Spirit. So they were on the covenant path. And I'm feeling it. <laughs> the Algonquins are um, descended from Nephite remnants that didn't get killed. Because you remember, all the Nephites were killed except those that would deny the Christ. Remember? And surely there could not be a happier people among all the people who had been created by the hand of God. That the, the scrolls that were put in front of me, some of them dated the uh, 800 AD. The story was the same. Right now, the chief elder came with me this last uh, fall after two years of working with the top, Jew the top Jewish rabbis who don't agree with nobody, but they agreed with us that we came from them. We came from them. That, uh, that even them, I said, hey, if this is the same, why don't you say something? And they said, because nobody's ever asked. And I said, well, why wouldn't they ask? He said, and this is literally what Grandfather Wawadi told me. He said that they prefer to live by faith instead of by knowing it's true. We came from a pre-existence as a spirit. We're born into this earth, into a body. We have a purpose to walk a story with the Creator, which is our family. And there's nothing greater than the family because our entire history says are the symbol of the day we win is two Jewish stars overlapped. You see it in all the medicine blankets. It's actually two, it's actually two stars. And where did that come from? It came from one winter when a boat appeared in, a, in the Great Lakes and it was frozen over and they came off. We carry this story. When it comes to the actual original parts of the Book of Mormon, they do lack a divine quality. While many non-Christians are familiar with eloquent biblical stories like the parable of the prodigal son or the Sermon on the Mount, non-Mormons are unaware of anything as eloquent in the Book of Mormon. Gary Rendsburg is a professor of biblical studies, Hebrew language, and ancient Judaism here at Rutgers. He's also the author of numerous books and publications about Hebrew literature. I, I work in the Hebrew original text and my work on chiasmus has been especially in the book of Genesis where it was first identified and I built on the work of other scholars. If the translator paid attention to these terms, you could actually uh, see this in an English translation as well. You're not a Latter-day Saint, nope. obviously. Um, have you had a chance to read the, the chiasms that uh, Jack has discovered in the Book of Mormon. What are your thoughts on them, your opinion on that? What does that mean to you? There, to me, uh, Jack's discovery, which uh, he presented when I was uh, together with him at a conference in, at BYU in Provo, it, it was so self-evident. It's the same issue then. How come nobody noticed it before, right? And uh, I, I still remember Jack Welch getting up there and talking about being a young man and studying the Book of Mormon, and he was actually in Germany, and uh, he highlighted the passages. And Now, this is all part of, you know, the creation of literature again, right? This is, and he began to show these things, and I was, to use that hackneyed expression, blown away by Jack's <laughs> discovery. And once he showed it, I said, well, Yes, obviously it's there. This is so all it part does of it. match up to what you would have defined. Very similar to what I discovered in the book of Genesis, the, the system of, of doing it. Yeah. Based on the chiastic structure. Right. Right. 
alone. Um, one can, and this was part of Jack Welch's incredible discovery, it would go a long way to establishing the LDS uh, uh, fundamental belief that this is a text from the ancient, from the world of ancient Israel. Okay. I want a Catholic Bible so I can talk to Catholic scholars. I studied the Gospel of Matthew in German, looking up all of the examples that Gechter had given and reading and finding others as well. But it was something that woke me up. Okay. And it was before the sun had come up. And the clear words were, well, if it's evidence of Hebrew style in the Bible, it must be evidence of Hebrew style in the Book of Mormon. And I didn't go back to sleep. And I didn't want to wake up my companion, you know, but I, I got out of bed and I, I did go and get my Book of Mormon. Or I just sat down at the table. So as I turned the page on Mosiah chapter 5, it didn't take long for my eye to notice two words, two big long German words that are the words for transgression. Übertretung, Übertretung. And those two words were right on top of each other. So yes, and then I just started going, well, how above that, below that? And of course, you can see that you are not found on the left hand of God. The left hand of God only appears here in all of scripture that I can find, and it appears twice. This has to be intentional. It comes to pass, take upon yourself the name of Christ. You must be called by some other name. Therefore, you find yourself on the left hand of God. I would that you should remember that this is the name that should never be blotted out, except it be through transgression. Therefore, and that's the turning point. Yeah. Wow, okay, don't transgress. Name be not blotted out. I would that you should remember, retain this name, that you're not found on the left hand of God but to hear and know the voice by which you shall be called and also the name by which he shall call you. I was pretty excited. Two days after the morning of the discovery of Chiasmus, uh, Brother Thomas was the academic vice president at BYU and he was the founder of the honors program, which I was in as a freshman in 1965. He also taught a class on the Bible as literature. He was an English professor. I did write a letter and told him about the discovery. He was excited and said, I've never heard of this. I think this is very convincing. You might talk to so-and-so about it. They said, you know, we were just retracting the other day and we found a, uh, a Catholic scholar, uh, a, a graduate student, studying at the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome. And he was kind of interested in what we said. Uh, you know, we have this Book of Mormon. Have you ever heard of it? And he hadn't. Well, let me tell you a little bit about it. That early, we began explaining this to people, and I learned from them, and they learned from me. You know, I became very convinced as I saw this working in changing people's attitudes about the Book of Mormon. They could take it seriously because it could be presented to them on terms that they could relate to. Somebody from an Orthodox Jewish background, uh, like the rabbi, takes the Book of Mormon seriously. Rabbi Joe Charnas. I study the New Testament in Greek. I'm, I'm not a Messianic Jew, a, a Jew who believes in Jesus as his or her Lord and Savior. Coming from the evangelical camp. See, again, people go to me and say, well, why don't you criticize Mormons? And why do you criticize evangelicals? I'm like, I'm not going to go to Samaria and turn over the tables in their temple, but I'll do it on ours. Something in the 1950s, somebody coined the phrase, I think it may have been a Catholic, said, the Book of Mormon is the one book in the world that you can have an opinion of and have never read it. <laughs> and <laughs> you can't just ignore the Book of Mormon. It is a text that's talking to us and having a conversation with our scriptures. And I think it's really important for us to, to hear, to have the ears to hear what's going on here, because I think that you can't dismiss the Book of Mormon, especially if you are a believer. I agree. I agree. It is a beautiful book. In fact, one out of seven verses in the Book of Mormon, Smith simply copied from the King James Bible. Which he was yes, it's a combination of texts from the New Testament in Philippians 4 and 1 Corinthians you know, 13. Lovely. But you put this as your final principle in your articles. And that tells me who you are. You allow people to be who they are. Worship according to the dictates of your own conscience, heart. You can't get any better than that. And so I wanted to know, how did this come about? What brought this beautiful inspiration into such a, quote, heretic? How could he live with this wisdom and be such a dark heretic? This ain't of the devil. This is not of the devil. This is of the one true light of the world.
So I wanted to know more. I began studying their texts. So wherefore ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. We have to press forward with a steadfastness, a commitment to something greater than ourselves, greater than what is simply before us that we can't see beyond. What is lying before us or lying within us is often dark and tragic and hopeless. But if we press forward in steadfastness, with commitment, with dedication, with devotion, or in humble servitude, having a perfect brightness of hope, if I were a charismatic, I would be on the floor face planting right now, shaking. Perfect brightness of hope. That is the most beautiful way of describing hope. The perfect brightness of hope allowed them to see the perfect one. And that led them into that love of God, which necessarily must lead us into love of human beings. But in reality, 7% of the Book of Mormon could be seen as being copied from other scripture. To be specific, here are the chapters that can be found in the Bible as well. 1 Nephi 20 and 21, which is Nephi's inclusion of Isaiah 48 and 49. Then 2 Nephi is about half Isaiah again, with chapters 12 through 24, and then chapter 27. 3 Nephi 22 can be compared with Isaiah 54, and 3 Nephi 24 and 25 can be compared with Malachi 3 and 4. Everything else in the Book of Mormon, the other 93%, the 6,100 plus verses, is original text that either Joseph wrote as a con man or brought forth through the gift and power of God as a prophet. Those are the only two options. There are no others. If Joseph was a fraudster, why would he have not copied them exactly? Let me give you some of my favorite examples. One of my favorite bits of evidence that a prophet of God brought forth a scripture is the Lord's Prayer. It is found in Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. I'm going to leave the verse numbers on here so you can mark these in your scripture. It says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is likely that Joseph, with his dedicated reading of the Bible, would have had this memorized. It is also likely that others in his family and the pastors and preachers in the area would have all had this memorized. Here is the interesting thing. The Lord's Prayer in the Book of Mormon in 3 Nephi chapter 13 is different from the New Testament version. It says, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Did you notice the difference? The Book of Mormon version doesn't have the phrase, Thy kingdom come. Why in the world would Joseph not include something like that? If he's a con man, he should copy it exactly, being something that everybody knows and even has memorized. But he wasn't a con man. He was a prophet who brought forth the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. So why would the Lord's Prayer be different? What is the difference in the timing between these two events? The Sermon on the Mount from the New Testament happens at the beginning of Christ's mortal ministry. The third Nephi version happens after Christ was crucified, resurrected, and then visiting the Americas. It was after the Lord Jesus Christ had brought forth the kingdom to the earth. He had brought the authority of God in the form of the priesthood and given it to his apostles, including the events on the Mount of Transfiguration, all of which happened after the Sermon on the Mount and before the account in the Book of Mormon. So Christ, when teaching the Nephites how to pray, would have naturally eliminated the phrase, Thy kingdom come, because it had already come. Christ had already brought forth the kingdom. Was this a lucky guess by a con man, Joseph Smith, or an evidence of the divine mission of a prophet bringing forth Latter-day Scripture? But if there were only one of these, it might be easy to say that Joseph Smith got lucky. But this is just one of many examples. Let me share with you my very favorite. Let's first look at Matthew 5, verse 48. It says, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven which is perfect. The comparative verse in the Book of Mormon is 3 Nephi chapter 12, verse 48, which says, Wherefore I would that ye should be perfect, even as I or your Father who is in heaven is perfect. 
you probably caught the change in the Book of Mormon version. I or was added. In other words, in the New Testament, Christ did not include himself as being perfect, but in the Book of Mormon, he does. Is this a mistake that Joseph Smith made, or is there something more to this? Again, what is the difference in the events between these two accounts? The New Testament version is prior to his death and resurrection, while the Book of Mormon version is after. Christ was not perfected until he was resurrected. Of course, he was sinless, but not perfected in the meaning that he was not completed, which is what perfect means in the Greek. He hadn't yet become like the Father in all ways until after he was resurrected. So when he appears to the Nephites, he is now perfected and like the Father in all ways. And he includes himself in that verse. Be therefore perfect even as I or your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Lucky guess by the Joseph Smith fraud or divine appointment of the prophet to open this dispensation. There are so many others, and I would encourage you to compare these chapters further and find your own insights. I'll give you one more here before we move on. The first part of Matthew 5.22 says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. That is different from the 3 Nephi 12.22 account, which says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of his judgment. There are some other nuanced differences, but the biggest difference is without a cause is not in the Book of Mormon version. Why would this be different? I'm going to ask you to use your common sense on this. Which one sounds more like the doctrine that Christ would teach? Because if Joseph Smith is a fraud, why would he remove that? But more than that, why would the New Testament version have a phrase like without a cause when Christ taught very clearly many places that you need to forgive others unconditionally? Seventy times seven, he told Peter. Does without a cause sound like pure doctrine, or does that sound like something that's been mistranslated or something added later by those who didn't like the doctrine? To me, it is clear that the Book of Mormon has the true, pure version of the Sermon on the Mount, and the New Testament is lacking. Remember the eighth article of faith. We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. For me, these so-called copy-paste sections of the Book of Mormon that resemble chapters in the Bible are some of the strongest evidence for the authenticity of the Book of Mormon, and a sure witness of Joseph Smith's calling as a prophet, seer, revelator, and translator. Of course, if Joseph was a fraud, he would certainly have had to think through the fact that the portions Nephi included would have been sections of the Bible that would have been prior to 600 BC when Nephi supposedly lived. But why not more from the first books of Moses or something else? Isaiah to Nephi would have been considered a contemporary, at least to Lehi, being just a hundred or so years prior to Lehi. Lehi's grandfather could have known Isaiah. So it is likely that Nephi really connected with Isaiah, especially when so many of his prophecies would be about his own posterity. But then in 3 Nephi, this is after the resurrection of Christ, so a fraudster Joseph could take the liberty of using things from the New Testament. So you have to ask, if he was a fraudster, why would he pick those chapters to copy from the New Testament? Would he have the mental acuity to pick the very best chapters to describe the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness? Nothing sums up the gospel better than these chapters. So either Joseph is a mad genius or he is a prophet of an almighty God. He would have had to know Greek and Hebrew at somewhere between a reasonable and a high expert level, depending upon what you believe. He had no experience in any of that. He would have to have known Jewish customs, biblical rituals, Hebraic poetry, language styles, and so much more. Smith's presentation was also aided by ripping off hundreds of New Testament themes and imagery that he repackaged for characters in his story. And Dr. Fields has been doing some groundbreaking work in identifying through stylometry the different writers of the Book of Mormon, the difference between them. Dr. Fields, hello. It's good to see you, Scott. What does that have to do with me being able to find internal evidences of the, of the authenticity of the Book of Mormon? Well, as the name says, stylometry means the measurement of style. And so if we take a look at the Book of Mormon, which claims to have various speakers over a thousand year period of time, we could look and see if they're the same or if they're different because they should be different if the Book of Mormon was written by 82 different speakers rather than just one person, such as Joseph Smith. I see, and how do you do that? Well, what we look at are the grammatical words. These are called function words. Okay. These are the words that are 
prepositions, conjunctions, pronouns, these type of words that don't convey any meaning, but they are the words that uh, speakers, writers use to, as scaffolding to construct their message. Well, let, let me give you a, this comparison between the Book of Mormon speakers and the speakers in the 19th century novels. Oh, very what you see are spheres, and each of those spheres are the words of a speaker, either in the Book of Mormon or in the 19th century novels. I'm seeing it, okay. So the biggest distinction is along that axis that separates the green spheres, the Book of Mormon, from the 19th century novels. Each of those colored spheres is one of the 19th century novels, novelists. This one's Jane Austen, and we have her- Oh, just it's blinking, oh, okay. Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility. Yes, I love that movie. And then we have Charles Dickens, which is Great Expectation. Oh, okay, very good. And Oliver Twist, James Fenimore Cooper, Last of the Mohicans, right? And Deerslayer, and then Great. Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn is the by Mark Twain. Okay. Now you'll see that the each of the authors' spheres grouped together. Well, they were created by the same mind, so that makes sense. It does indeed, yes. But you can also see that the speakers, the characters within an author are distinctly different from each other. Let's take a look at <clears throat> the Book of Mormon. Okay, which is uh, up here, the green Those stuff. are the green ones. Okay, I'll bring it down a There's little. 28 authors, as we mentioned, and they range from Abinadi to Zenith. And you'll notice how far apart they spread from each other. Okay, so who are we, now who, the, who's the, who are we pointing the, at here? The size of the sphere. Is the amount of words? The amount of words that each one speaks. So Mormon speaks 97,000 words. He's huge. the biggest speaker in the Book of Mormon. He has the biggest sphere. That's the Book of Mormon after Followed all. by Nephi, who has 28,000 words. Followed third by Alma the Younger, who has about 21,000 words. He's awesome. But look how they separate from each other. Because they are Statistically speaking, on this plot, They're they different. are that different of a voice. They are different. Okay. And so you'll notice now, most strikingly, however, in the entire display is the variation, the spread of those green spheres. Yes, compared to the variation and spread of even the best literary artists of their day. Exactly am I, am so. Am getting that right? And so there's more variation in one book, the Book of Mormon, than in eight novels written by geniuses of the times. Wow. Highly unlikely, as you said, for a farm boy, little education living on the American frontier. The Book of Deuteronomy says a false prophet leads people away from the true God, and he fails to predict the future. Joseph, Joseph Smith is guilty on both of these counts. So we should not believe God used a false prophet like him to transmit inspired revelation. <clears throat> Our Creator and Heavenly Father loves us. His Son, Jesus Christ, is our Savior. He is my Savior. And He lives and guides His church through His chosen servant. I bear my witness that Jesus Christ taught among the First Nations on the American continent, who recorded this visitation verbally and passed down through legends, and more importantly, physically, by writing them down on tablets, which were translated through Joseph Smith, and just like the books of Moses, Jeremiah, and Isaiah, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Epistles of Paul, James, and Peter, the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, and testifies of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith said, according to the book of Abraham, which Smith also allegedly translated, God is a superpowered man who rules near a star or planet named Kolob. The report goes on to say that the Cherokee have always believed that on another planet, a heavenly and holy planet, there exists a heavenly mother who lives with our heavenly father. This belief is very common among all tribes. The only church on the earth today that I'm aware of that also teaches we have heavenly parents is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the restored gospel. Speaking of the book of Abraham, Smith claimed he translated an ancient papyrus written in Abraham's own hand, 
But even Mormon Egyptologists agree that the papyrus he allegedly translated from was simply a collection of second century Egyptian funerary texts that say nothing about Abraham. But it should be noted that this theory does not match up with the eyewitness evidence we have of the translation. The 19th century eyewitnesses, both Mormon and non-Mormon, favorable and hostile to the church, agree that the Book of Abraham was translated from a long roll of papyrus that was still a long roll in the 1840s and 1850s. The current fragments of the Joseph Smith papyri, however, were all mounted on heavy paper and placed in glass frames in 1837. None of them can be the long roll described in the 1840s and 1850s. So these fragments are specifically not the source of the Book of Abraham, according to the eyewitnesses. The next question is, well, what about facsimile 1? It's right there on the surviving papyri. Doesn't it make sense then that the text surrounding this illustration should translate to what we have in the Book of Abraham? Well, to us that might make sense. In ancient Egyptian scrolls, however, sometimes these illustrations had no clear relationship with their surrounding text. And feel free to pause and read these quotes from people who back that up. In fact, this same guy, Hor, also owned a copy of the Book of the Dead written by the same scribe and illustrator, and more than half of the pictures don't match with the text. On top of that, there are actually no other instances of this scene being adjacent to the Book of Breathings. So while the text may not belong to the Book of Abraham, the text also doesn't seem to belong to facsimile 1. But there are two key assumptions that people often make. One is that people tend to assume they know what Joseph Smith was translating from. And usually the assumption is we have some papyri fragments, and on one of them is a drawing, we call it a vignette, Egyptologically. Um, that the facsimile one is a facsimile of this drawing, right? And so people naturally assume, oh, and I can good. understand that assumption, that Joseph was translating from the text around there. But there are a number of ways, and I go into it in depth in there, there are a number of ways of testing that assumption. It turns out to be a problematic assumption, and, and like 99% falsifiable, I would say. But all the evidence we have points towards the conclusion that that's not what he's translating from. And the second one? The second one is about the facsimiles. Basically, uh, they'll say, well, Joseph Smith says that these facsimiles mean this, and Egyptologists say that it means this. So why is there a difference? All right, so I'd say, first of all, we're assuming that we know that Joseph Smith is telling us what ancient Egyptians would have said about this. Uh, and then that Egyptologists can tell us accurately what ancient Egyptians from that time period would have said about this, and it's a time period where we actually don't know very much, and we've actually been able to look and see on, like, for example, the kind of drawing that facsimile 2 is. When we see what Egyptologists have been saying that these characters represented for a long time, and then we actually found some examples, John Gee found some examples where the Egyptians were telling us what they meant, and the Egyptologists were wrong in most cases, right? So, and by say the Egyptologists, I mean myself as well. Uh, there are many examples of this happening with Native American pictographs and petroglyphs, where archaeologists will theorize and make assumptions about what they believe these images mean, what they symbolize, and what they were depicting. But when you ask the living descendants of these ancients what the meanings of these images are, you get a very different story, a very different meaning. Native people today will often speak of these holy people who came to this land and showed them the path, the path that leads back to eternal life. Latter-day Saint Native Americans will point out the connection to the Book of Mormon. These ancient records that we have that speak of these different groups of families who came from the old world, from Jerusalem, these were Jewish people and they brought that knowledge of the covenant path with them. And of course, when the people became wicked and turned away from that path and from that knowledge, Jesus Christ himself came and visited this land to restore it. And again, when the people became wicked and were scattered and turned away from that knowledge and that covenant path, Jesus Christ came again in this modern day dispensation to once again restore that knowledge, those keys, and that authority to the earth at this time through the prophet Joseph Smith. 
and the translation of these ancient records which make up the Book of Mormon tell the same story that is told in the records of the indigenous tribes of North America. We see depictions of priestly robes and garments being worn in these ancient images. And it makes sense to me that when a person is depicted as being larger than the other people, and especially when they're given large, unusual eyes, to me that symbolizes having eyes to see. Perhaps this is a seer, a prophet, a leader who is spiritually large. And those families who came from Jerusalem would have been people of the star. That was their symbol, the star of David. But scientists, archaeologists, and modern day theorists will jump to more complicated assumptions, such as time travelers, other dimensions, and aliens, never considering that what they're looking at just might be ancient scripture. People tend to think that the na native people are like dead and gone and that um, if there's a discontinuity between Absolutely. what was done in the past and what's there now. And how do you see it as a native person? Well, I think it's kind of uh, amusing in one sense. Tragic I think at the worst because you have this linear thinking that a lot of people in the western world think about the world, that there has to be a beginning, a middle, and an end to it. That there's no way that you can have a continuum of prehistoric cultures that mm -hmm. continue on to this day. How can they be moderns if they were also a part of the past? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, the most dangerous parts of thinking that we can, whether you're talking about ancient cultures, ancient traditions, ancient arts or something, that we have to somehow rediscover these things when if we're just with a little bit of uh, attention to detail, we never have to have forgotten them in the first place. This is Petroglyphs, and I'm going to define some to you. Now this is what is depicted of Jesus Christ, and with his hands down here. Now to you, you may not believe that, but these are some of the understandings that we have. Here is an one that looks like a Y, it means balance. This one looks like an arrow, but it means to cross over. Here, it comes together. Here is another one, come together from different directions. And then this one is choice. And here is come to the place of the first water. Now notice that's a trail, and this is depicting the water. Now here are some others, petroglyphs. This is message. Here is a time coil. When you see a, a petroglyph with its arms down, it means that for you to pay attention. When it has the hands up, it means prayer. And then here is a petroglyph with no feet. That means that he is a spirit. Here is the Christ figure, and this is the Christ figure. Anytime he has a club foot, it means he was wounded. He has a wounded feet with, he also has a life belt. That means he has power over life and death. Here we have the death mask water. Uh, the death mask and the water meaning living water. Here is the path to the water, the death mask. And see, so you need to hear this. It's very important. It's a prayer and it leads to living water. The last petroglyph I'm going to share with you again is the Christ figure. Notice he's saying, pay attention. And his, here is his death mask and the, his, this one has the water, living water. Then again, he's wearing a life belt, which is power over life and death. And he has the club feet, meaning he was wounded. Like the head elder, he had pulled out of his bag two little antlers and he put it on his head. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a symbol that he must have known about us. 
because the deer family followed the the caribou family followed the caribou they made the big trails through nature and around the world the highways and freeways other than the rivers that people followed and he knew well enough that he was telling the people we need to speak to these people and they brought the lodge to us which is the, called Middu. it's the path of kindness established by the first father here is the path to the water and see so you need to hear this it's very important it's a prayer and it leads to living water. They tell us that this rock art was actually created by their ancestors who lived there long, long ago and in fact were the survivors of a flood. The Navajo referred to themselves as descendants of the holy people and that these holy people in fact helped them emerge after a cataclysm. The Native Americans who lived in that area called the ghost panel the panel of the star people with each of the, the daughters that tied to these two star women, women of the star, uh, 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 called that title as well. Now, we know that they gave us a symbol of the lodge, which is an eight-pointed star drawn by drawing two sticks that are connected in all directions. And when you draw that in the lodge, you actually make two st two overlapping stars of David. You'd right. also call it the, the symbol of Melchizedek. Clearly, they are strangers of some kind to these people. And if that's what it was, then we might assume that they are depicting extraterrestrials. Uh, I'd say it's also a false assumption that what Joseph says doesn't match up with what Egyptologists say. In a number of cases, it matches up pretty well. Yeah, really, really well, like enough to where you have to start to, to just believe that uh, coincidence is the guiding uh, idea of the universe or something like that if you're going to try and explain this away right so what is in the book of mormon could not on any so-called reformed egyptian or any real language have been contained on alleged golden plates like these this shows smith's claim about the reformed egyptian was simply part of his own imagination this account is from president russell m nelson back when he was elder nelson my neighbor, Sammy Hanna, is a native Egyptian. He is an academic scholar who moved into our neighborhood to accept an assignment with the university as a specialist in Middle Eastern studies and the Semitic group of languages such as Arabic, Abyssinian, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Assyrian. Upon learning the name Mormon came from our belief that the Book of Mormon is divine scripture, he was intrigued by the existence of the Book of Mormon. He had erroneously thought this was American literature. When he was told that the Book of Mormon was translated from the ancient Egyptian or modified Hebrew type of hieroglyphic into the English language by the prophet Joseph Smith, he became even more engrossed for this was his native language, and he knows much about the other Semitic languages as well as the modern languages. So challenged was he by this book that he embarked on the project of translating the Book of Mormon from English to Arabic. This translation was different from other translators, for this was to be a translation back to the original language of the book. To make a long story short, the process of this translation became the process of his conversion, for he soon knew the Book of Mormon to be a divine document, even though he knew virtually nothing of the organization of the church or its programs. His conversion came purely from the linguistics of the book, which he found could not have been composed by an American, no matter how gifted. Some of these observations, I think, will be of interest to you, as they were to me, for they clarify some of the unique aspects of the book. Number one, in Jerem 2, it must needs be this expression, odd and awkward in English, is excellent Arabic grammar. Elsewhere in the book, the use of the compound verbs did eat, did go, did smile, again awkward and rarely used in English, are classical and correct grammar in the Semitic languages. Number two, Omni 18. Zarahemla gave a genealogy of his father's according to his memory. Brother Hannah indicates that this is a typical custom of his Semitic forebears to recite their genealogy from memory. Number three, Words of Mormon 17. References made here 
as in other parts of the Book of Mormon, to the stiff-neckedness of his people. Brother Hannah perceives that this word would be a very unusual word for an American youth, Joseph Smith, to use. An American would likely prefer an adjective such as stubborn or inflexible. But the custom in the Arabic language is to use just such a descriptive adjective. Stiff-necked is an adjective they use in describing an obstinate person. Number 4, Mosiah chapter 11 verse 8. King Noah built many elegant and spacious buildings and ornamented them with fine work and precious things, including ziff. Have you ever wondered about the meaning of the word ziff referred to in this scripture? This word, although in the Book of Mormon, is not contained in dictionaries of the English language, yet it translates freely back into the Arabic language, for ziff is a special kind of curved sword, somewhat like a scimitar, which is carried in a sheath and often used for ornamentation as well as for more practical purposes. The discovery of the word ziff in the Book of Mormon really excited my neighbor, Brother Hannah. Number 5, Alma chapter 63 verse 11. Reference is made to Helaman, son of Helaman. Why did not Joseph Smith interpret this as Helaman Jr., which would have been more logical for him bearing the same name as his father, Joseph, and being named Joseph Smith Jr.? In Arabic, Brother Hannah explains, there is no word Jr. to cover this circumstance. Their custom is to use the terminology Joseph, son of Joseph, Helaman, son of Helaman, etc. Number 6. Helaman, chapter 1, verse 3. Here, reference is made to the contending for the judgment seat. Brother Hannah observes that the use of the term judgment seat would be quite strange to an American who might have used a more familiar noun such as governor, president, or ruler. Yet, in Arabic custom, the place of power rests in the judgment seat, and whoever occupies that seat is the authority and power. The authority goes with the seat and not with the office or the person. So, this, in the Semitic languages, connotes the meaning exactly. However, Mark Twain said the following, It is chloroform in print. If Joseph Smith composed this book, the act was a miracle, keeping awake, that is. Whenever he found his speech growing too modern, which was about every sentence or two, he ladled in a few such scriptural phrases as exceeding sore, and it came to pass, which was his pet phrase. If he had left that out, his Bible would have been only a pamphlet. Number 7, Helaman chapter 3, verse 14. In this verse, there are a total of 18 ands. Reviewers of the Book of Mormon have on occasion been critical of the grammar in such a passage where the use of the word and seems so repetitious. Yet Brother Hannah explains that each of the ands in this verse is absolutely essential to the meaning. When this verse is expressed in Arabic, for the omission of any, and would nullify the meaning of words. Number 8. Helaman Chapter 3, verses 18-19 through 19. Have you ever wondered why the Book of Mormon cites a numbering system such as this? Do we say 40 and 6, 40 and 7, 40 and 8? No! Joseph Smith's natural interpretation would, more appropriately, have been 46, 47, 48, without the ands. Brother Hannah excitedly observes that the use of and in 40 and 6 is precisely correct in Arabic. Remember, they number as well as read, from right to left, and recite their numbers with the and to separate the columns. Well, I have just cited a few of these examples. There are many more. As Latter-day Saint leaders, we are aware of the Semitic origin of the Book of Mormon. The fact that an Arabic scholar, such as this, sees a beautiful internal consistency in the Prophet Joseph Smith's translation of the book is of great interest. The Prophet Joseph did not merely render an interpretation, but a word-for-word -word translation from the Egyptian type of hieroglyphic into the English language. 
Brother Hannah said the Book of Mormon simply flowed back into the Arabic language. When you have a language written in, in, in the scriptures, it's like you preserve the language. It's like nobody contests that the language is dead. No, it's alive because of the scriptures. If Catholicism is true, the Book of Mormon is not divinely inspired. And Catholicism is true, so the Book of Mormon is not divinely inspired. Thank you. I remember an experience that I had as mission president some years ago when I presided over the affairs of the church in eastern Canada. And I'd met with about 30 different ministers of different religions. And the very first question I was asked was by a fine minister who said, Mr. Ballard, if you just give us the gold plates and let us see that they exist, then we would know that the Book of Mormon is true. And I looked at him and I said, Father, you know better than that. You're a man of the cloth. You know that God has never revealed religious truth to the heart and soul of a man or a woman except by the power of the Spirit. Now you could have those plates. You could turn the pages. You could look at it. You could hold it. And you wouldn't know any more after that experience whether or not the book is true than you would have before. My question to you, have you ever read the Book of Mormon? And he said, no, I haven't. That's how people will come to know whether or not the Book of Mormon is true. You will not get to know it by trying to prove it archaeologically or by DNA or by anything else, in my judgment. Just pick it up and read it and pray about it. And you will come to know religious truth is always confirmed by what you feel. And that's why Heavenly Father answers prayers. Do you suffer from dry, itchy, flaky skin? Tired of wasting money on products that don't work? Hi, I'm Lindsay Reach, the creator of Hydro Heal, a product that's been changing dry skin for almost two decades. I created Hydro Heal back in 2008 as a solution for my own dry feet. Countless pedicures and dermatologist visits weren't making a difference. And who has the time or energy for this method? Word on the street spread and Hydro Heal gained the attention of Shark Tank investors and venture capitalists launching it on a nationwide TV campaign, gaining interest and attention from celebrities on live TV. See it to believe it demos and try before you buy? Put Hydro Hill in the spotlight, selling out of product at every show. After my feet were transformed, I decided to test it on eczema, dry lips and hands, athlete's foot, and cradle cap. And the results were incredible. Brand new skin in just seven days. But it gets even better. Hydro Hill was also tested on a recovering hospital patient with an ongoing leg wound that would not close. After three days, this was the result. A wound that closed, healthy skin, and doctors were amazed. So how does Hydro Hill work? It's a solid ointment made from natural ingredients that turns into a liquid on contact with your skin, seeping down into deep cracks while acting like a bandage, creating an invisible barrier on the surface, protecting your skin from outside elements, allowing it to naturally repair from the inside out. Start feeling more comfortable in your skin today because everyone should love their skin. Click down below for a special offer or visit hydrohill.com.